All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you brought a loved one today to put a tourniquet around their neck. <laughs> appreciate you being here. And we uh, appreciate Cornerstone once again uh, hosting us to be able to do some medical training, some pepper spray training, some de-escalation training today. So we're going to cover a lot of different areas. So before we jump in, how many people here are members of Iowa Firearms Coalition? Good, probably 50%. The other 50%, we're going to work on you today to join the fight to keep our Second Amendment rights in Iowa. So we've got a table outside, so make sure before you leave, uh, you take part in that. Many people have asked about the $20 for the pepper spray. So everyone's welcome to watch, but if you actually want to take a water-based unit, not the real pepper spray, later this afternoon and hose down your husband, your wife, whatever, uh, We'll give you a real pepper spray, which you do not open in here. <laughs> that goes home with you. And then we have a little water-based one that you can practice, and it's a good idea because you can actually see you know, how far these things will shoot and get an idea when you have to use it for real. Is it five foot, is it 10 foot, is it 12 foot? Go out and practice in the wind. You'll be able to practice, uh, hopefully in here in a little bit. And then we'll uh, end the day with that. So. Morning session, we're going to talk about trauma care, we're going to talk about uh, emergency medicine a little bit. Um, I noticed when I walked in there's an AED in here, a Zoli unit, which is a real good one. Uh, we're, we're just going to kind of touch on that, but if you have specific questions on CPR, AED use, I'm happy to uh, answer that. In the winter, I uh, moonlight as a pilot in Arizona and also do medical training for a little RV park. And I don't know what it is this year, but people are dropping like flies. So the AEDs are getting getting a workout and also the CPR stuff. So very, very handy skill to have. As far as the emergency medicine, we continue to see things on television, the church attacks, the school attacks, uh, businesses. You don't know when the day is. So if we knew that tomorrow morning, during the morning service, somebody was going to come into this church and they probably wouldn't get far with Michael here. He'd burn them down before, before they got inside. But if there was going to be a traumatic event, how would we prepare? If we knew for sure it was going to happen, well, we'd have people outside with firearms, right? Stop the threat before it gets in. If they got in, I'm sure there's a team here that would end it quickly. But the likelihood is there probably is going to be, you know, some people shot, injured. So we don't get a pick when that is. But we need to prepare as if the day is coming. In the, in the aviation world, we train for the worst case scenario all the time. Engine failures, fires, catastrophic explosions, things like that. So when the smaller events happen, we've already been stress inoculated way up here, and the little events are, are much easier to handle. So we're gonna do a little bit of uh, stress training for you today. Typically we'll set up somebody outside with blood, and fake glass and all that, but it's cold and windy outside today. So we'll just do some simulations in here with, with you folks. We'll have you kind of cluster in the little groups. You'll get to pick who the victim is and where the injury is. And actually crank that tourniquet down on them and get a good tight and practice cutting off the blood flow. All right, so we don't get to pick the day. The day chooses us. And we want to be ready for that day, both spiritually, physically, emotionally. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So when I started this chair at the IFC a little over a year ago, we decided to jump into offering trauma kits to people. Because what I was finding when I go around and do these seminars is people would come up, oh John, I want to show you the tourniquet I got. I just got it from Amazon, it was just delivered. And I look at it and say, like, wow, China, very good. <laughs> You're gonna put the life of your family in, in the hands of China. And we would put that like on a two by four or something and turn it a couple times and the, the windlass would break off. So, we decided to go to put together real gear from North American Rescue and other suppliers. So we have two kits, and you can pick these up uh, after the session. We'll bring them out front. So the one in the red bag is uh, what we call our IFC responder kit. And we went to a company in Phoenix that's actually made in America. So it's a made in the USA bag. It's got a spot down below with elastic. You can put your tourniquet on there. You can have an extra one inside. It comes with two tourniquets and then everything you see in this bag. You get your chest seals, you get two survival blankets, you get the wound packing gauze, trauma shears, uh, 
some Cheeto gauze, which has the hemostatic agent in it. So it saves people money for one thing, running around and buying everything individually. And as we buy things in bulk, we can offer the discount down. And then what I carry every day is this around my ankle. And I actually do it every single day I have since 2018. I've had an ankle kit on. And I've never had to use the tourniquet. But I've had to use the wound packing gauze and stuff like that before. I, as I told you, Moonlight is a pilot. And I stop to get fuel and I walk inside. And the guy's sitting here with a sharp letter opener opening mail. And boom! Right into his hand. And it's going boom! blood spurting out and I whipped that thing off my ankle and here stuff that in there hold on to that what are you <laughs> just a pilot that's prepared uh, and then Michael mentioned on the Simon Conway show the other day I tested a young lady from Luke Air Force Base who's going to be an F-35 pilot and we got talking about medicine during the flight uh, oral portion and uh, said well have you ever taken like trauma care she goes oh I got a story for you she goes, they made us take this whole thing with the tourniquets and all that on the base. And so they gave us a kit. And she goes, and I was driving home after the seminar, and I saw a car accident, so I stopped, and a woman had broken her femur, and there was blood spurting out. So I took the top, the, didn't even have it out of the plastic yet. Took the tourniquet off, put it on her leg, saved her life. Mm. Same day. So again, you don't get to pick the day. So we have these kits available. Uh, you can talk to uh, the folks out front when the, Lunch break happens, and if you want to take one of those, now you'll know everything that you need to know about using it, and you'll have the supplies with you. It's one thing to have the knowledge, it's another thing to have the supplies, and to have good supplies that are actually made for this purpose, not Chinese knockoffs, not trying to take your belt off, uh, shoelaces, all kinds of different things that people tried in the past with a little effect. So just on, <coughs> excuse me, on the on the ankle kit, that's what's inside. Two pairs of gloves, a miniature trauma shears, a uh, SOF, Special Operation Force tourniquet, the uh, hemostatic agent, chest seals for bull wounds or penetrating chest wounds, and then I always add duct tape. So I have duct tape in my trauma kits. People say, why do you have duct tape in there? Because you can use it for everything. You can improvise all kinds of uh, different things for it. and when we've been flying and different things have broken in the airplane, like rattling pieces, just a minute, I'll pull some duct tape out and put it on the plastic or whatever's rattling and be able to have a little short-term fix till we get back on the ground. All right, we're gonna talk about an algorithm called MARCH. So if you've taken Stop the Bleed, Stop the Bleed is kind of like the junior trauma, basically tourniquets and wound packing. So today we're gonna get into pressure dressings, we're gonna get into putting on chest seals, things like that, so a little more in depth. And the algorithm for that, uh, it's come out of the uh, Trauma Combat Casualty Care, two triple C, and then when it got uh, into the hospital system here, so now it's TECC, Trauma Emergency uh, Casualty Care. We're gonna talk a little bit about using this algorithm to quickly step through assessing a patient. So the first thing is the M. M is massive bleeding. And you know when you see it, because you look at it and you go, wow, that's a lot of blood. So it's not a case where there's a little blood dribbling down somebody's arm or uh, you know, a little blood coming down the side of their face. This is like blood squirting out, blood pooling, uh, blood soaking through clothing. So I mean, it'll be obvious, gee, that's a lot of blood coming out. So the first thing you want to do in that case is keep the blood from coming out of the body. And when we watch people do simulations or real life events, they forget one of the most important things and that is get direct pressure on it right now while you're getting your tourniquet staged or whatever medical apparatus that you have. So that might be putting a knee right in somebody's groin or putting a knee up in a junctional area to stop the blood from coming down their arm. So the average person has about four to five liters of blood in their body and it doesn't take long. Just imagine a, a liter pop bottle and that blood's pouring out on the ground every time the heart beats. You get down to roughly about half of that and mortality goes way up. So the, the odds of surviving when you've lost about 50% of your blood definitely is, is, is tough. Because number one, you don't have much blood left in your body. Number two, your core is gonna get uh, cold because you don't have the blood moving through your body. And uh, <clears throat> the risk of death goes way, way up. So getting those tourniquets on immediately. How fast is immediately? I've seen videos of people basically bleeding out to the point they couldn't be saved in like 
16, 18 seconds, like for a real, real severe bleed. But typically, we're talking maybe two to three minutes. So getting a tourniquet on within about 30 seconds is going to be our goal today. So we're going to practice. We're going to put you under a little time pressure. If you hear the beeper, do not pull out your gun. Okay? <laughs> All right? This is not a challenge. I'm not shooting at this target up here until afternoon and only with laser pistols. So I have unarmed myself. So if someone comes in today, this is a laser gun, okay? It makes a green laser. If a bad guy comes in, the rest of you handle that because all I've got now is this. All right? Just so we're clear on that. Yes. Okay, so M, massive hemorrhage. So when we have you practice later today, this is what we're going to be talking about. All right, would that be classified as a massive hemorrhage? No. No? Yes. You see blood flying through the air? That's, that's a massive hemorrhage. So we would definitely get a tourniquet on it. Would you put the tourniquet right over top of the knee? No. No, definitely want to get above the joint and be able to cut that off. All right, so here's a good example. Got the patient on the ground, and you can see they're getting the tourniquet right up there in the groin, getting it pretty high to cut off the, the loss of blood right below his thigh. We're going to talk about putting these tourniquets on in just a minute. I, I see people all the time, they'll put like right here on the elbow. How are you going to get compression when you're trying to get down around a joint like that? You're trying to compress all that muscle and the blood feeding against the bone to stop that. So you have to either get above it several inches, or if it's down here, you can go here. But easiest solution is just stop it right there. Okay, another question. Is it okay to put a tourniquet on if I'm not quite sure? Yes. yes. Absolutely. It's always better to do it and have done it. And we had a case where the paramedics got there and said, oh, dude, you didn't need a tourniquet. I said, it's not tight, it's just on there in case we needed it. You know, like if the blood flow started to increase. So you can stage it, have it there, but not tighten it if you think you might need it. Or if you're in doubt, just go ahead and crank it down. All right, here's a good one. Saw a case where a guy had glass sticking out of his arm next to a vehicle that had a broken window. Hmm, I wonder how that happened. So you have to think when you're like reacting to these scenes. You walk outside of Walmart and a guy's laying by his car and there's blood pumping on him. He's got glass stuck in his arm. Might have been your vehicle he was trying to break into. So like, do you immediately provide care to somebody like that? Or are you going to be going, where is the bad guy? So lots of things when you assess trauma. If you watch it happen, if you see it happen, an injury in the shop, class, in school, something like that, pretty obvious. If you show up on a scene, you got to think, Okay, how did this happen? Who caused this? And where are they right now? Would you pull that out of the arm? Say, like, here, let me pull that out and put a tourniquet on you. No. no, that's actually acting as a tourniquet. That's stopping the blood flow. So in this case, we just lock it into place, put some gauze on either side, kind of form a little bridge around it, and, and keep it in place and let the medics get there and do their thing. So mark M, massive hemorrhage. A, airway. Are they breathing? If we find someone laying on the ground, you can just gradually tilt their chin up just a little bit toward the sky, see if we can help them breathing. And we're doing this really, really quick. And M is always first because if there's blood coming out of the body, the rest of this doesn't matter. We've got to get the blood stopped first. Worst case scenario, we can put the old nasal trumpet in their nose, but I've never had to do that. I hope I never did. I did it once on myself and it was no fun. I'm sure some of the uh, military folks in here probably had to use this in the field. I have one in my kit, but we did not include that because, at least around this area, you're going to have medical care. But if you're a hiker or an ATV or you're going to be out in the middle of the desert two or three hours away from anybody, then it's not a bad idea. Respiration. We're moving now to things that are affecting the body's ability to breathe. And this is a big one we see in Arizona. Broken ribs from everybody out on their side by side. And you've got the retired folks who are out there racing each other, Mario Andretti versus AJ Foyt, and they roll their thing over, crush ribs, break ribs, and a lot of times the outcome is bad. We had one of a gentleman in our park that uh, 
got what's called a tension pneumothorax. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he basically had broken ribs, penetrated the lungs, was filling his chest cavity with air and suffocating himself. And it just happened that a BLM guy drove by who had a trauma kit and had a, a needle decompression kit. Went ahead and put a needle right there. And I said, did it sound like an air compressor? He goes, yeah, it actually like blew the guy's hair when he shoved it in his chest because he had so much uh, air built up in the pleural space. All right, so we're gonna look for trauma to the thoracic cavity. This could be a gunshot wound. It could have been a piece of rebar that hit and got pulled out. Uh, we're wanting to basically just cover that. And we're gonna show you some, what we call vented chest seals. They basically look like this. So if everybody can see that, can you see it has a little channel in the middle? So that goes right over the, whatever the penetrating damage is, and that allows the air to burp out, but not allow air to come in. And so we want to get these on quickly so that we don't get into a situation where they fill their chest full of air and start crushing the heart and other organs. And if there's an entry wound, would you want to look for an exit wound? Right. So we can't just leave somebody laying flat on the ground and we'll assess what well, bullet holes, patch, patch, call 911. We need to roll them over and actually do a, a good assessment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit for assessments on what do you do, how involved do you get. So here's a good picture of somebody that's actually put a chest seal on. We have a gunshot wound and they put that on there and that is about all as civilians we can do. Now he needs a surgeon. Okay, here's a couple cases. Got a piece of angle iron stuck in somebody. What do we do with that? <laughs> Leave it alone. Again, hold it in place. If you have some gauze like this, again, you can make a little brace on either side. Kind of wrap it into place. Don't pull it up. Don't wiggle it around. We'll I'll be thinking about down the road when the medics get there. This has been in there a while, so it may have a uh, tension pneumothorax for me. So we talked about that needle, and that is not something we'll demo today, but I've taken a class in it, so I would feel comfortable doing it if I needed to, but it's not something you would do if you haven't uh, had training in it. But that's actually going to get put into the, the chest and allow the uh, air to escape, but you can see the impact there. Every time he breathes in, the air is not going out, it's just crushing everything over. second and third intercostal space. So there's a good example. So a real quick story, um, Mike Wendell who runs the shooting range in Carroll, uh, he had a family member who was involved in a four-wheeler accident and he's an EMT and he assessed the accident, started driving home from Minnesota for Iowa. Uh, there are two different vehicles but she says, hey, you know, I'm not doing very good. And first thing when I saw the Facebook post was, ooh, I bet it's a tension pneumothorax. I bet they got broken ribs that penetrated the lung. And sure enough, they got back and went to the ER in Carroll, and that's what it was. She was gradually just crushing everything inside on the drive from Minnesota back to Iowa. So if you've been in an accident like that or smashed the steering wheel or rolled over on a motorcycle or something like that, it's a concern that you've got injuries that you may not even be aware of. C, get into the, uh, so we've got Massive hemorrhaging, airway, respiration, now C, uh, C is circulation. So if we've stopped their bleeding, tilted their head back, nothing obvious as far as uh, penetrating wounds, now we get into uh, the CPR scenario. So who in here has had CPR training of some kind? Majority of you. So you probably know that, that the, uh, the latest and greatest is if you see someone go down and they're not breathing, we do the uh, 
basically CCC, continuous chest compressions. So we're not so worried about the respiration at this point, especially if we're just one person. So we start immediate compressions while we're hollering for someone to get an AED, and hopefully there's one nearby. <coughs> so what do we mean by continuous ch chest compressions? So the medics like to say, well, you know, everybody does the Bee Gees thing, right? Staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> there's other ones that work too. Does somebody know some of the other songs that work? Baby shark. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. I'm getting about that 99 beats per minute in there. So, so that's good. Any, any other ones? Don't break my heart. My achy, breaky heart. That one works too. So the mistakes that we see when people are actually doing the, the uh, continuous chest compressions is stopping. So what happens when you stop doing the compressions? Yeah, imagine you're blowing up a balloon and you're blowing it up, blowing it up, and then you stop and they're Everything that you've just done just went for naught. You're building up that hydraulic pressure in the body. You're moving blood uh, through the system and up into the brain. And as soon as you stop, it starts going back the other way. So if you're getting tired, what should you do? You, have, you pass it off to someone else, but you're, you're getting their hands on while you're continuing to do it, and then you move your hands out of the way so you don't skip a beat. Same thing when you're putting the pads on for an AED. Continue the compressions, get the pads on. When the AED says stop and move, then go ahead and get your hands out of the way. We see all the time, oh, I'm tired here, you do it for a while. Okay, everything you just did is, 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 is for nothing. Has anybody done CPR and had a positive outcome? One? Has anybody done two? Anybody done three? Anybody done CPR and had a negative outcome? Right. So it is a low probability that we can help, but it's worth a try. And depending who you ask and what you read, it's somewhere in like the 10 to 17 percent range. I only had to do it once, it was seven minutes, but the person came back at seven minutes which was amazing. The medics got there and like, wow. But it was uh, due to a, a drug overdose. And they said, probably gonna have brain damage. This person might not be able to ever talk or speak again. Went to the hospital. This was before Narcan and all that was available. And uh, ended up totally fine. So, uh, by the grace of God. But it's, it's scary, you know, hearing ribs crack and everything as you're doing proper CPR on somebody. Then also their eyes open. And like, wow, okay, that was impressive. So when we do an assessment for uh, a patient, I'll give you a, a good example. Putting this algorithm into place, uh, two years ago we're up at our lake cottage in Minnesota and there's an outdoor sports bar with outdoor dining right across from the lake. And I see people pulling a guy out of the water and up on the shore and the cop pulls up and he's just like, well, the person's not moving. And, and so I'm sitting there like, oh, is he gonna do anything or is he just gonna stand there? I said, oh, I can't, I can't sit here. So I jumped across over the little fence, ran across the road to the beach, and started doing an assessment on the guy, and he had a big rake down the back of his back, but it wasn't bleeding. But you could tell he had run over by a boat. And so the, like the pontoon went across his back, and uh, he was actually kind of like gurgling. And so looked him over quick. I said, let's roll him onto the side, get him in the recovery position. So as we rolled him on the side, he started puking out of water. I said, it's a good day. So that guy made it, and then we saw down the beach, another guy got pulled in like 100 yards down. So it was drunk boaters that ran into each other, and the people went overboard, and the people saw him and got him into shore. But it was one of those things like, please, you know, quickly go down that algorithm. Is he bleeding? Nope, it was just right down the steps of the march algorithm. So this is not a once and done algorithm. So once we go through it, we reset, and we start going back through again, or moving on to other people. But in, Cases that we've been talking about, like, okay, did it work what we did? Is the bleeding stopped? Do we need a second tourniquet? Working through that algorithm continuously. We'll show you some examples of training uh, about that. So there's what we talked about the recovery position, getting them over on their side, getting their arm tucked underneath them like they're taking a little power nap. H, head and hypothermia. So if they've had any considerable blood loss, their core temperature is going to be going down. So I did some training a couple years ago in June at the church. Uh, 
just west of Des Moines, and they're like, why on earth, it's 100 degrees outside, are we putting foil blankets on somebody? It's like, well, we're simulating that they've lost a bunch of blood and their core temperature can drop even if it's hot outside. Arizona, we use foil blankets all the time at the church security work. Why would that be? Because the pavement is 160 degrees, and if we have to put somebody down, we don't want them to get burned. So the foil blankets are actually very handy for that. So uh, assess damage to the head, and then get them covered up if they've had blood loss, uh, the clothing is wet, anything just to kind of prevent them from going into a shock with their temperature dropping, and then restart and go through it again. So when you do an assessment, we have to have the leaders out there. Who's in charge? You are. You're the one who just stepped up and said, hey, I'm going to look at this person while we wait for the medical folks to arrive. So make people do what you want them to do. So you pick somebody up. You're going to call 911. Here's the address we're at. You're going to keep the gawkers away, the people that are going to try to put this on Facebook Live. So we'll take extra people and actually kind of like make a little fence around the patient where everybody turns and stands out here like this and so you're working. So they have some privacy behind them, especially if you have to cut off clothing. And I had a case in Arizona and they're like, why are you cutting your shirt off? And the only thing I think of is, I carry trauma shirts all the time, I wanted to put them to use. <laughs> But the real reason was I wanted to see if he had a pacemaker. Before we slap an AED on him, you know, cut the shirt off, get it off easy, see if there's any you know, zipper lines where they've had surgery, because then I'll probably reverse the, the pad order. So, something to think about there. Unfortunately, with females, they're going to have to cut off your underwire, and that's where the trauma shears are handy, because if you're going to get an AED put on, you want to get rid of the, the wire on your chest. So the trauma shears will cut right through that, clothing, boots, belts, uh, all very cool. So who's in charge? You are assigned duties. Know the address of where you're at. So if you're at a restaurant, know what the address is. If you're at a school, if you're at a church, know what the address is. So when you call 911, it's like, oh, I don't know, you know where the Walmart is? You know, it's like three blocks north. Know the address of specifically of where you're at. Scene safety. Is it safe? Are there bad guys lurking around? What caused this and are they still here? So in the church security world, if we're tending to somebody outside, we've got other people watching. We don't know what caused this. And again, we, we train for all these high-end things like the, the active shooter and things like that. We had two fatalities in our church parking lot, but it was from a traffic accident. But we had people there that were trained in medical and were instantly there to respond while we waited three to four minutes for the, the folks with the ambulance to show up. If somebody's conscious, it's a good idea to say, May I help you? If they're unconscious, and then they wake up after CPR or something, they can be combative. So the person I was telling you about was kind of like gurgling when they came back. So I put my finger in their mouth to make sure they weren't swallowing their tongue. And that's right at the time when apparently they got a little consciousness and clamped down on my finger so hard I thought I was going to lose my finger. I'm like physically prying the jaw open, may I have my finger back please, thank you. And then getting the flashlight and looking at the eyes and saw you know, no pupil reaction, saw that, oh, this is probably an OD. Good Samaritan laws, know what that is? Right, so if we're doing treatment according to the training we've had, then we have some coverage from a legal standpoint. But if you start like cutting into people and doing like the scene from the office and stuff like that, uh, not going to go well for you. So you're covered for the training you've had. So if you've had a step, stop the bleed, a traumatic bleeding class, you can say, well, I only did what I, you know, I put on a tourniquet, I put on a chest seal, I packed a wound. So we're good there. So when we have looked at people, and, and Billy in the military, more, more so probably than any of us, when you do an assessment, you're going to find things that will hurt you. I have found multiple concealed weapons. Like, wow, well, it's, a, it's a Ruger, whatever. So we want to get those away from people because if they are starting to come alert again or whatever, they're like, whoa, where's my gun? What's going on here? So definitely uh, assess, assess them when you're doing your patient uh, assessment. And I like to rake the body. So I'm actually like moving my hands down their legs. We're not missing anything. Removing clothing 
and uh, use those extras as we talk about to kind of fall the barrier. So I don't know if I can make this play from here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. So this was a simulated patient. There's a bullet hole wound simulated at the chest seal on. Where? Okay. Is it still bleeding massively? Is your tourniquet not tight enough? Yeah. Once we stop the massive bleeding, we're working down that algorithm to check everything. Okay, can I have the uh, check the zero way. What have we finished the massive bleeding? We already wanted to cover him up before they come for the full assessment. We have another Let's pump the blood on brachial artery. High and tight. You use a ratcheting motion. That really hurts. That probably is going to cause more pain to them than the actual injury. Okay. Check the airway. So we did massive bleeding. Now we're moving to airway and then respiration. So is he breathing okay? Obviously, he was talking. Ah, uh, it's labor. Okay. What? What about the arm part? Does he have any other chest wounds? Go to check for a problem. Oh! Might help to move clothes. You don't, you don't have enough, cut him in half. Tell them what they need, because I'm dying. Let me stand there. Give him a knife. Check the other three. Check the other three. That guy wants to get that blanket on there. And even if it's exit, you want to get this covered pretty quick. You know? Yeah. Okay. Keep this covered. Yeah. So let's roll him over on his left side. Okay. Now notice he's got a, he's got an injury over here. Do you want to move him on top of the injury or not? No, I want to move him. Get him on the other side. <laughs> Keep track of what's going on there. You And we have an extra one. So we cover that one with another one. And we have an extra one. If we don't have enough chest seals, it's perfectly acceptable to take your shears and cut one in half. Because the biggest thing is blocking those holes. So you see these guys had had, had like the first hour and then we set them up there. And you find that when you put yourself under stress, you just lose about 50% of what you just learned. So even though they had the algorithm, we talked about the steps, you know, the one guy, oh, put a blanket on him, oh, put a blanket on him. And they kind of stopped the assessment. So you can see the importance of working through that rapidly, do a very quick assessment across the entire body, and then say, okay, he's got this on his leg, he's got two entry wounds, he's got one exit wound, and start getting things put together. So did you learn anything just watching some guys there that uh, had had limited practice on a church security team? The most interesting part of this is we were right outside the church and we totally forgot about like we probably should tell law enforcement that this is staged <laughs> and we had a a female police officer showed up and started to panic like oh my god there's gonna be a it's all fake everything's fine so uh next time we do an outdoor thing we say hey just so you know if you drive by the church you know there's gonna be blood and guts and it's all fake so don't get anybody ramped up. Any questions about what you just saw there? What would you do differently from what you saw? Yeah, get, get rid of the clothing. So you see they were like timid. They had just enough knowledge to like start doing things, but nobody really took control and started barking out orders of, you do this, you do this, you do this. There you go. Okay, here's another class. This was one we did in Kansas, and they had, had about two hours of training. They had practiced with tourniquets. They're a little more squared away, but, but it's good to watch what is basically, you know, your colleagues in real life after a very minimal training, and then uh, starting to actually do an assessment. <laughs> and this kid that did the, uh, played the role of the victim, was, he, was, he likes doing it, put it that way. Whoops. Now we're 
next one, there we go. Hit play. Thank you. <coughs> no, it says quick time not available. So I don't know why that won't play there. All right, so that's unfortunate. All right, so we will stop there. These guys, uh, the woman you see on the right, she was actually partially disabled. She was missing her arm. She got in there, started barking orders. You, nine one one, just boom, 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 boom. Took control of the situation and uh, took care of the guy. And it's too bad you couldn't watch it because he's a uh, he, he had a lot of things going on. All right, so let's we're gonna just gonna go down through everything again. We're gonna let you guys practice a little bit. So tourniquets. We recommend authentic tourniquets. If you go on the internet, just search uh, approved tourniquets. Uh, the Committee on Trauma Combat Casualty Care has a whole list. Uh, we try to pick the ones that are, number one, the simplest to operate, uh, reasonably priced, and that's these right here, the CAP tourniquet, combat application tourniquet. This is the latest generation. And I will see police officers or fire guys with their tourniquets like this. What is the problem with this? It's in the wrapper. Number one, under stress, how's your motor skills doing? Not good. Now let's take some blood and stuff and put it on your hands and try to open that. Okay? So pretty tough. Get them out of the wrappers, have them stayed. So in my kits, I'll show you the other tourniquet. So this is the soft T, and you can see it's a little more compact, and that's good for the ankle, or if you have limited space, where the caps are a little bit larger, but uh, slightly easier to operate. All right, another thing I see, this little thing here with the time thing on it. Time is not super critical in our world. Time to get the tourniquet on is important, but we're not so, worried about writing a time on there because we're going to have medical folks here in pretty short order. But I will see tourniquet staged like this. So they'll have their little bearing vest on and it'll be like this. Do you see a problem with this? Yeah. So this is now blocking access to the windlass. And so this is now Velcro there and again under stress of a traumatic thing and somebody's pumping out blood, you're like, oh goodness, how do I get that off there? I gotta get this tourniquet out here. Finally. So have it staged like this where that is open. So you can immediately get to that. So I have mine staged, so when I pull it out, I have a loop. Because now it's instantly ready. I can put it on an arm, I can put it on a leg. So if I had to self-apply this, the little red thing goes toward the center line, toward your heart. So if I have to self-apply this tourniquet, I'm just going to put it on my arm like this. I'm going to zip that down, get it tight, and now I'm going to turn that. And I usually have a pull sock so I can show people that it totally cuts off with about a turn and a half or so. Lock it in there. Now if you're going to leave it on there, first of all we want to Definitely make sure blood is stopped pumping out. So it's okay to tighten it more, it is not okay to loosen it. So I have heard people in the past say, well, we should restage our tourniquets, to loosen it. No, once they're on, they're on. Go ahead and tighten it more. If you haven't stopped the blood, put a second one on. Okay? My fingers are starting to turn blue. Why do we put it where we pull it toward us? If you're self-applying. Yeah, it's leverage. You're a lot stronger pulling toward your center line than trying to go like this away from your body, right? Okay? So that's another common error. If you're putting it on somebody else, depending on where I'm standing, I will put it toward me. So the red, if you're laying on the ground, I'm putting it on their leg, the red tab will be toward me, so I go. And again, using leverage. All right. I will restage this and we're going to pass these out here in a moment. So when I put these back together, I fold it up so I get like three folds and I'll pop that through, peel it back over. 
So now I have it fairly flat and ready to go back in the kit. So I made these in the hotel last night. So if you get a call from the Best Western, <laughs> there sounded like someone was dremeling at like 10.30 at night. Yes, we were. So these little foam noodles from Walmart with the, some PVC in the middle simulates the bone. I would recommend, however, that you try it on yourself. Put, try it on your thigh, try it on your arm. If buddy up with somebody, maybe get in little clusters of four or five people and pass tourniquets around. If you don't want to put it on yourself, grab one of these because that will definitely give you a good simulation of crunching it down towards, pull it as tight as you can and then give it a couple turns. So, Jennifer, are you in here? Me? Yes. Me. Yes, you. <laughs> All right. So I've got, I think, 10 or 12 tourniquets here. So we're going to pass these out, grab a handful. Yeah, just like one every couple rows and... Uh, stuck. So just kind of look them over for now. If you want to form little groups... So I'll have you pass, pass it on the prior group and then forward or backwards. Let's talk about putting it on the leg for a moment. Okay. Did you say if you have it, yeah, you can pass those foam noodles up too. Would you want, if they had a broken leg or there's blood gushing out, would you want to like lift their leg up and slide that up? No. No. Undo it, slide it underneath, and then you can kind of like do a seesaw motion, get it up above the joint, and then go in and winch it down. We'll give you a couple minutes to play here, and then we're going to put you under some time pressure. Just imagine as you're putting that on yourself that you've been injured in an auto accident or an industrial accident. You got a forklift that just smashed your arm, and there's blood coming out. You got to put that on with one hand. So a little bit of pressure. Okay, I'm going to play the victim here. So I'm going to simulate that I've got a wound right here. Okay, so I'm going to lay on the floor. And someone's going to have to have enough common sense to get up, get a tourniquet. So the wound is here, but I want you to look everything over to make sure you're not putting a tourniquet on top of a gun or a knife or a pepper spray or a cell phone or something. I got all kinds of gear in my pockets. <laughs> Microphone. Maybe we should do this leg. Do we do we cut it off or cut it off? Yeah. <laughs> Thumb drive. <laughs> is there a, a point, let's say at the top of the head, where trying to put a drilling in on We will get to that. That's, that's the next step. Okay. Just to repeat what he said, tourniquets are for the limbs from here on out, from the groin on down. If you have a wound in the groin, in the shoulder, up in here, these junctional areas, that is the next thing we're going to talk about. Okay? So we would not, not put a tourniquet here. Unless you have a dog that won't quit barking or something. All right, so I'm going to come down here and I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, I've been shot or stabbed and I'm going down on the ground. Somebody help me, please. Uh oh, get back. Who's, what's, oh, very good. All right. Here, hold on, hold still, hold still. Okay. Yes. 
tourniquet. Call 911. See, it's really good. He's, he's put pressure right in there in the groin to stop the bleeding while you guys are figuring out what these blue things are. Oh, what's this? What's this? We got a backup gun. So I am bleeding. How much blood have I lost so far? Too much. <laughs> that doesn't seem tight though. Okay. Pull it, pull it. I can get my finger underneath there yet. So get it up. There you go. Now we're talking. Is the ambulance on the way? I told somebody to call 911. Who called 911? He told someone to. I called 911. Yeah, this is going to hurt. Can I twist that? Yeah, so usually you want to have that at a point where you can easily get to it. Okay, all right. Well, you want me to do it? It's all right. That's all right. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> That's a whole string of the needle. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you Yeah. Roll me over the other way, too. There you go. <laughs> there we go. We're talking. Okay. How long did that take? Too long time. Can I do that? Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much. That puppy pushed it up. All right, so that's good. Thank you for all the tools back. <laughs> yes. When you were laying down there, you were your legs, you were laying down there, you were laying down there, you were laying down there, you were laying All right. So you can be the victim now. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, just lay down there. So he did a nice job on, he got his hands involved and got pressure on it. If I had to do this for real, I'm probably going to be even less nice than he was. So I'm probably going to go down like this. Yeah, your knee. And I'm going to get the knee in, into the groin or a knee into the shoulder because then they've got 215 pounds of pressure that's going down to crush that down against the bone to try to stop it. Okay, but he did a good job. He got his hands in there, kept pressure. If you have extra people to help, say direct pressure right there above the wound while someone's staging the tourniquet and getting it on. Does that make sense? Or if it's in the shoulder, you know, you're going to get right in here and you're going to get pressure right down in there. So whatever way you can to work on him. So in this case, you know, I get down like this and get pressure instead of coming clear across his body just to give me a little more room to work. Does that make sense? All right, you can get it. All right, thank you. Okay, so take your tourniquets off. Okay, that came from here. Restage them as best you can. At least have a little loop. So now I want you to buddy up with somebody, have them, have them sit, stand, kneel, whatever position, slump over, whatever you want, and you're going to have 30 seconds on the clock, okay? Here's an extra one, let's use this one. That's all right. <laughs> all right, so find a victim, just going to do tournaments here. Have you located your victim? Let's get on the floor. I am. So, they can be on the floor, they might be slumped over, they might be sitting. You need to move them. Don't jump off. Alright, here we go. 30 seconds, you have 30 seconds to get that tourniquet put on.
good point. Pull it as tight as you can before you use the windlass. The windlass is just that extra bit to cut it off, but the more you have it tight, and then Velcro, before you turn that, the better off you're going to be. However many times. Yep. Do an assessment. Again, when I'm looking at somebody, my hands are on them. I'm moving down their legs. I'm moving down their arms. I'm checking for any blood or any wounds on their body. 